Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, there are a number of ironies in the Christian faith, and most of them you come to appreciate and even embrace and love over time. Those little things you come across that at first seem contradictory, but in the end reveal one of the truths of God. Well, every once in a while, one of them sneaks up on you. And you come across an irony and you go, really? Well, that happened this week. And it happened with our gospel reading. As I read just a few moments ago, and as I do every Sunday, I read our gospel reading. It just happened that this week, it came from Mark chapter 6. And it's the story of the beheading of John the Baptist. Now, as it starts out, it appears that Jesus' fame has gone far and wide. It's all throughout the countryside. And people are starting to wonder, who is Jesus? Some think he is Elijah, come back from the dead. Others, a prophet. Others, just like a prophet of old. But then word reaches Herod. Mark calls him King Herod. That's more of an honorary title. He wasn't really a king. This isn't King Herod the Great. This is one of his many sons, Herod Antipas. And Herod Antipas was a tetrarch which means little more than a governor. But Mark gives him the honorific title of king, and he obviously thought of himself as a king, as you hear later on in the text. But word gets to Herod Antipas about Jesus, and he thinks it's John the Baptist. And then the text goes into a flashback. Now here's what you need to know. Herod Antipas had been married to a woman named Phizalus. She was a Nabatan princess. And I don't know what their marriage was like, but over time he came to meet another woman named Herodias. Now Herodias was first of all his niece by a half-brother, but she was also a sister-in-law by another half-brother. Well, Herod Antipas meets Herodias. He immediately divorces his Nabatan princess wife, and in this odd, incestuous wife swap, he marries Herodias. Well, you can just picture John the Baptist. He's still out on the street. He's still doing his ministry. You can picture him out there preaching about the Ten Commandments, and when he gets to the one about don't commit adultery, he just points up to Herod's palace and says, don't commit adultery like that. And everyone goes, oh, yeah. And they all get it. Well, it's because of that that Herod puts John into prison. Now, what's interesting is we don't know exactly why. We know it has to do with John's preaching. But was it because Herod had a grudge against John, which is possible, but I think unlikely? Because you read later on in the text and it says Herod liked to hear John and he revered John as a righteous man. More likely is that he was protecting John from his wife Herodias, who held a grudge against John because he was calling her out. He was calling her adulteress. And she wanted to put him to death. Whatever the reason, John now sits in prison and he's there for the better part of almost two years. That is, until Herod throws a birthday party. And he invites all of his guy friends, all of the nobles of the area, they all come together for what you can imagine would be a multiple day drunken revelry. And they're all together and they're having a good time. And then Herod calls his stepdaughter, 
The girl he calls is Herodias' daughter Salome by her first marriage to Philip. So Herod Antipas calls Salome to come in and dance for his birthday party. And she comes in, and my gosh, what a job she did. <laughs> this must have been the most lustful, licentious dance, and it pleased all of the guys. To the point that Herod says, that was great. You can have whatever you want. Well, the young girl doesn't know what to ask for. And so she runs out to her mother, Herodias. Now remember, Herodias has a grudge against John the Baptist. And she finally sees her chance. Herod can't protect him anymore. And she tells her daughter, go back and ask for the head of John the Baptist. And she does. St. Mark tells us that she not only went back, she immediately went back with haste. She was eager to do this. And she told Herod Antipas, I want the head of John the Baptist immediately on a platter. Well, the text says Herod was immediately remorseful for what he had promised. He wished he could have taken it back, but because of his pride, his pride, because of that, he couldn't relent. And so he does. He sends the executioner out. They behead John the Baptist. The executioner brings the head on a platter, not to Herod, but to Salome, who immediately gives it to her mother. Now that's the story. And there's no irony in and of that in and of itself. What happens, the irony comes next. Because just like I do every Sunday morning, I read the gospel lesson and then I say, this is the gospel of the Lord. Really? I mean, gospel means good news. I'm not hearing the good news. This is John the Baptist. Remember, this is arguably the first Christian who ever lived. He leaped in the womb when Jesus came near. This is the same man whom Jesus said, there is no one greater born of woman except John the Baptist. The forerunner of our Lord, he's murdered out of pride. And this is the gospel of the Lord. I'm not hearing the gospel. What I do hear in this text is the realization that the Christian life isn't easy. And it's more than John the Baptist. Go back to the Old Testament reading, the story of Amos. Whether you know Amos or not, it's a great story of a prophet. Amos is down there in southern Judah. This is at the time of the divided kingdom. And God calls him and he goes up to the north. And he's preaching against the king up there, King Jeroboam II. He's going to die by the sword because of his idolatry and his immorality. And it's the priest of Bethel who intercedes, a man by the name of Amaziah. And he comes up and he says, the land can't handle your words. Go home. We don't want you here. And Amos comes back and he says, I didn't want to be here in the first place. I had a thriving business in figs and sheep. I didn't want to come here, but the Lord called me. And Amos is rejected solely for preaching the word of the Lord. And then go to our epistle reading, or better yet, to the author of our epistle reading. I remember those of you who were in vacation Bible school or helped out. We had five different Bible stories. And the last one was the conversion of St. Paul. You remember Saul is on the road and he's blinded and he goes up to Damascus. And there he sits for three days blinded and fasting and praying until the word of God 
comes to a man named Ananias. And God says, Ananias, I want you to go to the street called Straight, to the house of Judas. There you'll find a man, Saul. Heal him of his blindness. And Ananias, he comes back and he says, Lord, I've heard of this guy. He's no friend of yours. He's no friend of the Christian church. And God said, go anyway. Because I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Suffer. One of the greatest missionaries of the Christian church begins and endures a ministry marked by suffering. Beatings, whippings, stonings, shipwrecks, exposure, hunger, thirst. And then you know how it ends. He's beheaded just like John the Baptist. The Christian life isn't easy. And we really shouldn't be surprised by it. After all, Jesus told us in his own words that if they persecuted me, how much more will they persecute you? Christian life isn't easy. We often forget that as we live in our country of affluence, of our wealth and money and peace. We don't have bombs dropping around us. We aren't at want for food. In fact, most of us are a little overweight. We have cars, we have gasoline, we have good roads, we have clean beds. We often forget that over here, but it's true. And many of you know it. You may not be persecuted for your faith, but you are still suffering. I've heard the story. I know what's going on in your life physically, spiritually, emotionally. The Christian life is marked by suffering. But remember, I told you, it's an irony. It's an apparent contradiction that eventually proves out one of God's truths. Because the realization is there's gospel in this reading. But you've got to dig for it. It's not gospel that John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ, has died. That's not the gospel. The gospel is that because he's died, we see that there's more to the life than this. We have something to look forward to. We have the promise of eternal life. In our epistle readings, St. Paul, he talks about us being adopted by God as sons. Now, please don't get hung up on the whole sons and daughters thing like you're being left out. That's just not the case. In the ancient world, daughters weren't adopted and they didn't inherit anything. But what he's telling us is that regardless of who you are, whether you are a man or a woman, whether you're black or white, whether you're rich or poor, whether you're Jew or Gentile, you have been adopted by God as a son. And you have an inheritance that is waiting for you that will never rust or fade or wither away. Through Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. And you have something so glorious to look forward to. You know, there will be a day when Jesus returns and he will call John the Baptist's name. And John the Baptist will rise from the grave like all the saints of the past. And he will enter into eternal glory. And that eternity will be so wonderful, so joyous, that it will make his sufferings and his imprisonment and his beheading 
seem small and petty in reflection. As though it was something so minor as to be forgotten. And you, as God's adopted child, you have that same promise. That we have something to look forward to that is so wonderful, so glorious, that the sufferings of this life will mean absolutely nothing. That is the promise of the Almighty God to you. But realize that that promise is more than just a future certainty. Because what we can count on in the future affects what we do here and now. Because knowing what you have waiting for you, you can live each and every single day boldly, confidently, without fear. Because what can they do to you that Almighty God hasn't already promised to undo and to make even better. We are able to live without fear because God has your back. You know, I've stewed on this irony all week and it still gets me. Really? I mean, John the Baptist is beheaded. This is the gospel of the Lord. <laughs> really? And yet it's true. Not because John was beheaded, but because of what his beheading points us to. An eternal glory, an eternal reality, and an eternal promise that will overshadow and outweigh any sufferings in this life. Yes, there is suffering. The Christian life is marked by it. It is defined by it. But you have something to look forward to that will make suffering pale in comparison. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding Keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.